Hi, I'm Daniel Lucas, and welcome to Movie 101. Movie 101 is all about the movies that are like for the last 40 years. And today, I have my special guest. He is the executive producer of Hope Studios, no other than Mr. Kevin Christensen. Pureflix or Sony Sony owned Pureflix and um, and so they were they were wanting to get some distribution with them and they just didn't have the right connections from their team and so we were able to connect with one of the heads there and uh, negotiate a, a distribution deal for them um, to bring that series to streaming which was exciting because <clears throat> excuse me because um, you know, Pureflix has over a million subscribers on there. And so it was, it was fun to be able to bring that project as one of the first things that we did to that uh, distributor and be able to bring that out to the world. Yes, indeed. So how does Hope Studios select its projects or artists? That's a great question. Um, you know, there, there are so many ideas out there and, and so many stories that any one of them is probably a great story to be told. I mean, you know, when people come and, and talk to us and, you know, fairly often we get people saying, oh, I've got a story or you should turn this into a movie. Um, you know, there, it probably is a good story. Um, most people are not bringing something <laughs> to you if they don't think the story is good. So to some extent, you kind of have to assume that by the time it's resonated with somebody, it is a good story. The challenge is, is bringing that story all the way to the screen because there are hours and hours of work. There are, um, you know, potentially millions of dollars that are gonna be spent on it and you wanna make sure that it's a success. And so, um, you know, we have, a, we have criteria that we look at that makes sure that the stories that we're telling are going to, um, you know, embody uh, our values of hope. That they're going to um, embody uh, that they're going to embody values that, um, you know, reflect um, <clears throat> a a positive outlook on on life, and that people can walk away feeling more more challenged, hopefully, um, to to grow in who they are. Um, and if they're seeking hope that hopefully they, you know, find that hope by the end of the film, hence our name, Hope Studios. Um, <clears throat> but we also, you know, we also have to look at what kind of an audience is there for this film because just making a good film isn't enough to get theaters to allow you to show it. It's not enough to get a streaming deal. Um, you know, anyone can upload something to, to YouTube, but if you're trying to get something on Pureflix or Netflix or up TV or, you know, in theaters, um, you really have to demonstrate that there's an audience for that. And so that's the other thing that we evaluate is, is there an audience for this story? Um, or are we going to have to spend a lot of time and energy educating people on why they need to care about the movie first? before we even share what the movie is. So in our upcoming film, The Hopeful tells the story of, of a movement where there are now 22 million people that are a part of that movement. So that's a, that's a pretty good size you know, to safely say, okay, there are people that are aware of this story that know about this story. Um, you know, There's a lot of people we're not going to have to educate on what the story is to get them to care about the film. So. It's a combination of finding stories that fit the values that we hold, but also stories that actually have an audience there before you even start. Very well said, Mr. Kevin. But before we go on, can you introduce yourself to our listeners or uh, viewers? Yeah, so, um, so my name is Kevin and I um, currently head up Hope Studios. Um, when, um, when I graduated from college, I never actually took any film classes. I took business classes. And um, when I was in college, I actually started a, a live sketch comedy show. And that was kind of my crash course with producing. And I was like, oh, wow, I really, I really like this, you know, because I 
kind of started. I, I did some some theater um, and drama classes in in high school as well as in college, and I you know you you start to want to do more. You're like, oh okay, well you know I could act better if this was uh, if this was written differently. So then you start to learn writing, and then you go, oh, this could this whole thing could be pr- pr- produced better if if you know I started directing it, and then you start learning. Oh, the whole thing could be done better if I learned how to produce it and finance it and organize it, you know, and so you kind of move into producing. And so, um, so I, I, um, went to Atlanta and, and got in, you know, on kind of whatever I could get on, um, small projects, student films. Um, fortunately there was quite a bit of, of stuff that was shooting in Atlanta, a lot of, a lot of Marvel, um, HBO Max, DC Comics um, projects were all shooting in Atlanta because of the tax incentives. So it was, it was um, pretty easy to get on projects simply with supply and demand. You know, so much stuff was moving there from Los Angeles <clears throat> and you didn't have the massive talent pool that's, that's kind of saturated in L.A. So it was a lot easier to break into things, um, you know, in Atlanta simply with just the supply and demand, so much stuff shooting there and not as many people that are, you know, all in the film industry. So it was a great opportunity for me to be able to, to learn so, so much um, in such a short amount of time. And, um, and so I, I, you know, picked up what I could with that and kind of learned how sets work. And so it, it helped out <clears throat> with, with kind of where I am now. Um, uh, understanding sort of the business side of things. The, the big shift for me actually happened with, it was a conversation with the accounting department. I was working on a very large budget um, uh, union show, so not a small indie film. Um, and, and I went and talked to the accounting department and <clears throat> I noticed that my checks never said, th- this, this show was... Um, uh, this was in, uh, MTV and um, um, Dimension that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and, you know, I noticed that none of my checks had a recognizable studio name on it. It was this no name LLC that that we were all kind of working for. And I was a little confused by it. And I was like, why? Why is that? You know, um, none of the projects that I worked on were from, it never said Universal or Netflix on the check or whatever. It was always this no name LLC. And they said, oh, well, it's pretty standard practice. You, you know, the studio never, never pays directly out. What they do is they open up uh, an LLC, they put their money into that LLC, and then that LLC is able to do the production that it needs to. Um, it's able to, you know, kind of work almost like a startup. And, um, and then when it's done, you know, it'll close down and, and give the film back over to the studio or something. And, um, and so I was like, wow, that's really, that's really interesting how that setup works. So, you know, when I ended up connecting with, with HCI and they said, we'd like to expand out beyond broadcast television and move into film. Um, I said, you know, it is a completely different setup. Uh, it's a completely different business model entirely. You can't have this this business model where you're hiring people in kind of in house to work with you, and everything is being paid out of you know the the organization directly <clears throat> because you know they have assets to protect. So there's a lot of red tape and checks and balances, which is good because. You know, you, you, you can be liable for a lot of things, but it also slows the process down. So I was explaining, you know, if you can set up this this model, um, this is how all the major Hollywood studios do it, which is what I learned from that conversation with the accounting department. I said, you know, you can start doing a lot bigger things. You can move faster. You can also tap into film tax incentives, too, which was something that um, they had never done before, which they, they couldn't. As a nonprofit, they couldn't do that. Um, and so we kind of opened this new model with Hope Studios doing that. And, and so I'm really thankful for those opportunities that I had in the film industry to, to sort of learn, um, you know, some of the setups with things and kind of combining my background in business 
with the practical onset experience of working in Hollywood. Interesting bio, Mr. Kevin. But before we go on, I want to shout out to the people listening according to my ranking tops in the last 30 days. Because in Zambia, I got number one on the Apple chart. Gambia, number 16. Sherloin, number 43. Republic of Korea, 213. New Zealand, 49. South Africa, 192. And a lot more. Thank you so much for supporting this podcast. Because this podcast is great and power movies, movies, people. So, Mr. Kevin, what types of artistic mediums does Hope Studios primarily focus on? Yeah, so we mostly focus on um, film and I would say kind of cinematic series. So um, we love feature films. Uh, feature films, I think, are... Um, Feature films are actually a lot easier to get distribution for. You can go a lot further with them um, than series. So it, when you're trying to expand your reach and impact, um, a feature film can go a lot further. That being said, a feature film can sometimes be a lot more expensive and a lot more difficult to produce. <laughs> a lot goes into making one. Um, <clears throat> but you know the reward can be so much greater, you know, if you're able to kind of trudge through that and get there. Um, so we, we love feature films, but like I said, we also do, um, uh, and I don't know if the term is correct with cinematic series, but um, not as much kind of broadcast television type series. So we're, we're not doing um, like daytime talk show kind of things or, um, or some of those types of things. But we, we do love getting into documentaries, uh, docudrama. We're actually um, putting together a docudrama series now. Um, <clears throat> and we love animation. Um, I mean, kind of, kind of anything that, you know, is this intersection of high quality and messages of hope. Because I think when we look at the films and series that are out there, Today, I mean, I, I watch a lot of movies. I watch a lot of shows. Um, I, I, I'm, I love this industry of storytelling, and I've been very blessed to be able to even see a lot of films way before they come out, uh, either at the American Film Market in California or going to different film markets and festivals um, <clears throat> like ICBM, the International Christian Visual Media Association that's in, um, that happened this year in Nashville. Um, it's seeing some of blind skates, new films that are going to be coming out over the next several months. Um, you know, I, I love those opportunities. Um, but you know, when you, when you look at all the stuff that's on TV and, and in theaters, there's a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of, a lot of dark stuff, a lot of negative stuff. I mean, you know, we've, we've literally got a movie coming out <laughs> Civil War <clears throat> that talks about, you know, a civil war breaking out here in the United States. And I don't know if, if life imitates art or art imitates life with that one. But, um, you know, we've got so much stuff that's just kind of talking about people dividing and pulling apart. And, and I think, I think that we need more places um, like what Angel Studios is doing, what Kingdom Story Company is doing, um, you know, what some, a number of those different places are, are doing where they're trying to promote these positive stories of, of, of light and hope and faith and, you know, giving people real purpose with things. Um, so we, we're excited to, you know, be a, a, a player in that space um, of hopefully bringing more stories that can share a message of hope for people. Yes, looking forward for that hope. Mr. Kevin, how does Hope Studios support its artists, both creatively and financially? Yeah, so um, Hope Studios is part of Hope Channel International, which is a 501c3. So we are very fortunate to have an incredible, incredibly large group of donors who support us um, with tax deductible donations. And, you know, they really believe in the mission of what we're doing. And so that that's very helpful because that allows us to be able to focus more on the mission of what we're doing. We're not tied to um, to shareholders in the sense that a lot of studios are where, 
you know, and, and we've seen that backfire. I mean, on, on a lot of places, you know, right now there's a whole lot of discussions happening at Disney about um, some of their, you know, they're, they're a publicly traded company. So there's, there's a lot of other companies interests that are being held in there. Um, and they're even going through a whole thing right now where some of their, their board members are trying to take over certain seats because they've found that as, as much as Disney has, you know, tried to kind of focus on storytelling, they've started to weave into an area of, um, of, you know, well, what's, what's going to make us the most money and what are certain, uh, things that we want to ensure that we're almost special interests. What kind of special interests are we focusing on in that? And it's affected them really poorly financially. I mean, it's, it, and this isn't from any values based perspective at all. Like when you read what they're talking, what, what some of the, the, the board members are talking about, they're talking about the fact that at the end of the day, we want to make money. And the way that we make money is with your brand integrity. And you've lost the, we feel like the brand integrity has been lost. Um, and so, you know, we're losing money as a, as a result. It's really fascinating to watch this as like an outsider. I don't have any shares in Disney or anything. So I'm just watching this <laughs> with this, you know, but, but seeing kind of the discussions that are happening there, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to kind of see how, ultimately that's that's affecting um you know the the content that's being made so we are very fortunate that we don't have shareholders we don't have stockholders that we have to go to and so that allows us to to not be pulled into special interests that we're really able to focus on the mission and saying okay we want high quality storytelling and we want stories that share um you know messages of eternal hope so uh so we're supported with with donations but the way that we work is is again very similar to the hollywood studio model not in values but in business where they invest in a production and so then that production is able to work with crew members whether that's you know um and i'll speak from kind of a, a u.s north american perspective but if we're working with you know, IATSE union crew members, if we're working with the DGA, uh, with SAG, with the WGA, you know, we're able to work within uh, established minimums um, and, and ensure that everyone's paid fairly and paid properly. Um, because I think that that's really key uh, to things is the, the, the business, to me, business is just as important as the art. Because if you don't do proper business with people and you don't treat them fairly, if you don't credit people appropriately, um, that can end up ruining your art. You know, you get people that go, uh, they they don't they don't believe in me, so why should I believe in their project? And and, it, and I think the art suffers as a result. <clears throat> you know, and so um, so we we make sure to take care of you know our artists and respect them and value them. And in fact, with the hopeful. Um, the director of it, who is an Emmy award winning director from Australia and he's part of the Australian directors guild. Um, he, I mean, he was in one of our calls with our executive producers, he, he teared up, um, to see just how much we trusted him as a, as a creative, our, our previous president, uh, Derek Morris, who was president of, of Hope Channel International when we started this project, we've since had a transition. He retired and we got a new president. But at the time he was president and he said, you know, the reason we brought you on board with this is because you are an artist and you have a creative vision. And so, you know, we're, we're really entrusting you with that. You've been you've been given that gift. Um, so, you know, why would why would we bring in someone with this gift of of storytelling and then go, let us tell, tell you how to tell the story, you know? So, um, uh, it's, it's really great when you find good creatives who want to work with you and because it is a two way street, I, I, you know, that being said, I've, I've also met creatives who they want to die on every creative hill that they have. And, you know, filmmaking is a team sport. And if you're not prepared to be a team player, then do TikTok because that can just be you, you know. You don't have to work with anybody else, anybody's ideas or creative. Uh, you know, but with with film, there's you know it is a team sport, and there's going to be times that 
Um, you know, people that are looking out for different things than what you're looking out for will come in and say, uh, hey, I think we really need to change that because it will overall benefit the project better. You know, I think of just just even simple things like um, um, let's 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 take let's take wardrobe, for example. You know how sometimes there's certain certain patterns on shirts, lines, you know, if you've ever seen something usually that's lower budget um, where it shows up really weird on your TV or on your screen and it's super distracting, right? Like the frame rate can't keep up with the, the pattern on a shirt and it's really distracting, you know, well, if a director has a creative vision with something, they may envision someone wearing something particular, right? And they're not thinking in terms of that pattern is going to show up really weird. But, you know, uh, someone from, from wardrobe might come to them and say, hey, um, I know that you have this initial vision, but I really think we should have them wear this shirt. It sounds so simple, right? And it's like, but this is my creativity. You know, and if they, if they go and die on that hill of, but I really want this shirt because this is how I pictured it in my head, it's going to end up causing people to completely miss the point of what was happening in the scene later because they're so distracted by you know, what's happening with the frame rate and the shirt pattern and what ends up happening. You, you turn to your friend, you go, man, that shirt looks weird. Is something wrong with the TV? And you're completely missing what's happening in the scene. And so, you know, you just have to be open to with, with anything. Sometimes it's major changes. Sometimes it's something as minor as a shirt change, but, but trusting the creative team around you and knowing that they have the best interests of the entire film in mind. And will you trust them with their creative input on each step of the process? Very well said, Mr. Kevin. And we hope that Hope Studios will empower people all over the world. So what challenges has Hope Studios faced and how have they been overcome? Well, um, we faced a lot of challenges just with this, with our newest film, with The Hopeful. Um, I mean, there were pretty significant um, budget challenges. You know, we, we didn't have a lot to work with. Um, we're, you know, historically, um, <clears throat> Hope Channel International has, has kind of just worked with, with broadcast TV budgets. You know, and broadcast TV budgets are a very different scale of budgets than a feature film. So it, it, right out the gate, you know, saying, hey, we want to do this film on this scale, um, you know, the, the, the ticket price of that was, uh, a little steep for them. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it took, you know, a bit of convincing to our board and finance committees to say, you know, I think this is something that we need to do. And, um, and so we, we signed on with that and, um, and, <clears throat> and then we, we had, um, you know, we, we had challenges along the way, but I, I can't deny the fact that um, a lot of prayers were answered. Um, you know, case in point, um, I love to tell this story of when we're shooting the, the opening scene with this ship. So we wanted to be historically accurate with um, it's it's the true story of a missionary who who goes over to Switzerland, that's what kind of bookends the, the whole film. And so he's telling the story to his kids and, and the story is how they ended up on this ship. And so, um, so we needed to find an 1800 ship and, you know, most of those are dry docked in a museum or they are at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to find one that's still operable. And we found this one over in Scotland and we went there and we only had a few hours to be able to film with it because there were tours and then it got too windy to fly a drone. And um, so we, we had our crew there and unfortunately uh, it was scheduled to start raining like right at 6 p.m. right when we were going to start <laughs> filming everything. And so we, we gather our crew together and we had an amazing crew that had worked on stuff for the BBC, Netflix, um, uh, HBO Max, or just now Max. Um, and we gathered everyone around for the safety briefing. And then I actually asked them to bow their heads and, uh, and join me in prayer. And, um, you know, they obliged, uh, probably partly because we were paying the bills. 
<laughs> and we prayed for, you know, safe shoot, good shoot, good weather and uh, setting men and got to work. And an hour goes by and we have no rain and two hours go by. We're getting all the shots we need and there's still no rain. I mean, it was scheduled to rain this entire time and we get through the entire shoot. No rain. We come back to the dock. We disassemble the drone. We, we unload it and, and put everything in the vans. We close the doors and right then it rains. And it was just the most amazing thing to, you know, to have happen because we did not have a backup plan. The CGI, if we'd had the CGI that it, it would have been so expensive. And even then it wouldn't have looked that great. It would have looked kind of cheesy. So instead we ended up with these beautiful shots and, um, and I heard later that, um, you know, part of the film crew asked the local or commented to the local producer, said, you know, I've never been on a shoot where they prayed before it. And the <laughs> producer said, well, it worked, didn't it? <laughs> it worked. God, as they said, God is good, as they said, <laughs> right? <laughs> so before we go on, Mr. Kevin, I want to invite you to listen to my other podcast, Book 101 Review on my fourth season, people fourth season and please do listen to my latest episode i uh, have a sunday we talk about science fiction fantasy novels so please do listen book 101 review plus my books are out not only one but three volumes people book 101 volume one highly recommended volume two selected and volume three recommended available on amazon and leading online bookstores worldwide so mr kevin are there any collaborative projects of hope studios in particularly proud of yeah well we are very proud to be bringing the, our movie the hopeful to theaters on april 17 so it'll be rolling out first in the United States. Um, you know, you can find it in most major um, theater chains, AMC, Regal, Cinemark, although we've been finding other independent chains that are interested in carrying it already. Um, and we're very excited to be bringing that to the big screen. And then we already have distribution locked up for the fall in Australia for that launch in theaters there. And um, actually, last week, we just started talking about um, Africa and, uh, and, and Central and South America. So very excited to be taking this story um, internationally. And, you know, um, the, the film it tells a true story of a revival that happened in the mid 1800s. A group of people that thought that the end of the world was going to happen. They thought that Christ was going to return. And um, it was called the Millerite Movement. And so you can Google it and look it up and see kind of what came about with it. Um, a lot of fascinating ties to history. Um, it's, a, it's a gentleman who survived the War of 1812. And he was trying to understand why he was kind of the sole survivor from his platoon in this battle. And he turns to the Bible. He, he's convinced that, that God saved him. And so he turns into the Bible and starts trying to find answers for himself with that and comes to this conclusion that Christ is going to return in a few years. And he starts this movement getting people, you know, convinced that Christ is returning. And, and in the process of that, it, it gets these people to start looking at the Bible and, and, you know, trying to, they're seeking truth. Um, and so you have Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists, like people from all different denominations that are, are kind of starting this new de non-denominational movement, searching for truth, but also, you know, expecting the world to end. And spoiler alert, it is a true story. We're all still here. <laughs> we'll not end. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they get to this moment and... And they kind of have, um, they have a choice to say, is this going to be the end chapter in our journey or is this actually the beginning chapter of our journey? And it's kind of this story of, you know, Phoenix rising from the ashes and this new movement, the Advent movement um, that begins saying, okay, let's, let's look for truth. And what do the Ten Commandments say? What does the Bible say? Um, not necessarily what does my pastor say or what do my parents say, but 
if this is what I've ascribed to is, is the Bible, I want to look for, you know, for truth in it. Um, and so it, it grows into this large movement that um, really values health and values rest. Um, you know, that was a big thing that kind of separated this movement from a lot of other denominations at the time was they really believed in what the ancient, what the, you know, if you go way, way back all the way, even to, you know, in the Bible timeline to creation and what most Jews are known for of taking a Shabbat or, or a Sabbath, a rest, taking a rest once a week. And they said, you know, we really feel that there's value in that and that that's written right in the 10 commandments. And so why have we kind of, we've stuck to all other nine commandments. Why do we throw out one? <laughs> <You know? laughs> let's, let's stick to all 10 and have a day of rest. And what's the value with that and, and, and health. And so as a result, a lot of those principles then kind of manifested in, in large healthcare organizations. They were some of the first to start that kind of healthy revolution that we see today. You know, I mean, you go, I go to AMC theaters and they have impossible chicken nuggets that you can order. You know, we've got veggie meat now that's everywhere. This group was one of the first to start veggie meat. Um, so, you know, there, there's a whole lot of stuff with, with health involved with that. And, and it, it, they ended up launching um, the largest, um, uh, the largest Protestant healthcare system in the world. And so, um, you know, you've got this outspoken woman who is standing up for things that most people, I mean, most people would kind of disregard a woman's opinions anyway, back then. So much less someone who's standing up to really bold things like this is right before the civil war and saying, you know, we've got this law that we're supposed to return a slave to their master and we're not going to follow that. Um, they were very bold abolitionists um, pre-Civil War and then and then during Civil War and after. Um, and, you know, and, and even bucking things at the time of, of saying, uh, I don't think I don't think uh, tobacco is good for us, you know, and I don't think, uh, you know, having uh, bloodletting or like that stuff isn't. <laughs> Us, you know, and and at the time, that's what medical experts were saying. No, this is good for you. This, so you know, they're bucking a lot of trends that since then, you know, history has caught up to it, and we're like, yeah, you're right, slavery is wrong, and yeah, you're right, bloodletting is not healthy, and yeah, you're right, can't uh, smoking causes cancer and a slew of other things. It's not healthy. So uh, you know, they were very outspoken with these things, and so as a result, she became one of the Smithsonian Institution's top 100 most influential Americans of all time and became the largest translated, um, the, the most translated female nonfiction author in the world. So, you know, we felt like this is a story that needs to be told because you can go to, um, you can go to Zimbabwe, you can go to Brazil, you can go to Romania, you can go to China, you can go to Korea, um, and you will find people that still ascribe to the values of this movement and, you know, and that's very unique with a film. I mean, how many films can you make that people in so many parts of the world go, I connect with this story that somehow this is this is my story and I'm connected to a part of it. Um, and I think that representation today is is more than just skin color. I think it's more than just, um, uh, you know, gender identity. I think it's more than just nationality or, or language. Um, you know, we've, whenever we talk about representation, we typically think of it in those categories. I, I think representation is also in values because you can have people from all over the world that are still united by shared values. And I think that those values need to be represented in films. Very well said, Mr. Kevin. So how does Hope Studios engage with the community and its audience? So we have, um, we have uh, materials actually that, that go with the products that we, that we produce, whether that's series or whether those are films. Um, we actually have a site if you go to hope.study. You can see the interactive study guides that we have with things, um, and we've been we've been partnering with a number of other places, like with with the hopeful, 
Um, we are working with a publisher to uh, to put out a book that is also by the same name, The Hopeful, um, that is a historical narrative. Uh, so we want to connect with people that they want more information on the story. You know, you want more details and there's only so much that you can cover in 90 minutes. So we want to connect with, um, you know, with book clubs and people that want to connect, that want to dive in more um, on the history of that. We also have uh, a book called Steps to Christ, the hopeful edition, which is one of um, <clears throat> Ellen, who's one of the main characters. Um, it's one of her most read books. Um, and so we, we did a, the hopeful edition with that and even an audio, audio book that goes with it. And, um, and we're looking at, at wanting to do more uh, events. We've started sponsoring events, partnering with different events. Uh, we actually just had uh, something called the Crown Awards uh, this last week in Nashville. Um, there's a really great organization called um, International Christian Visual Media, ICBM, and they present awards for uh, excellent films, and the award show is called the Crown Awards, and they present it during the National Religious Broadcasting Convention in Nashville. And so um, Angel Studios was there, uh, Kingdom Story Company was there, and we got to show our new trailer, be one of the premier sponsors and and talk a little bit about the film and then actually present the award. The winner was Jesus Revolution. Uh, so we got to present the award to the director and producer uh, with Kingdom Story Company. And, and that was exciting, honestly, for me, because I'm I'm a big fan of that movie. I, I really liked how well it was done and how, um, you know, just high quality it was. So it's kind of exciting to be able to, like, personally present the award to them. Uh, so we, we've been partnering with a, a number of different film festivals and film markets um, to, to connect with people and kind of share the stories that we're doing and, and learn from each other too and, and see what, what, um, what other people are doing and, and see how we can you know, connect in those spaces. Yes, indeed. Let's empower each other and learn each other. So, Mr. Kevin, what is the vision and mission of Hopi Studios for the next five years? So that's a that's a great question because um, <clears throat> we we've kind of been uh, learning a lot and and shifting over the last uh, just couple years. You know, seeing what's working, what what isn't working. I mean, but we are we are committed to. Um, to this larger vision of, of reaching 1 billion people with a message of eternal hope. And we want to find all avenues to do that. And I think that film is one of the most powerful avenues to do that because films can travel so far and, and they can reach so many people. Um, and they're to some extent they're evergreen, you know, it's, it's not something that you just kind of watch once and then forget about and move on to the next thing. You know, it's something that you talk about you engage with and you, um, and then we can, we can translate it, we can dub it, we can share it with new, new places and it, and it stirs conversation. And, you know, I, re I really think that, that films change lives. Um, a lot of the values that we have and how we shape, um, our viewpoints and perspectives come from films. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's so many quotable quotes that we can share with each other and we know exactly what it means and it's framed our perspective of how we live life and so i think it's a very powerful tool um and that and that tool can be used for good or for evil so we really want to harness that tool to use it for good um to inspire people and and encourage them uh, motivate them uh, to have hope to um, have purpose and to hopefully bring hope to their communities and their friends and their family. Um, we don't, we don't, I know it sounds ironic because like we're making entertaining films, but we don't just want to make entertainment. Uh, we really want to create stories that inspire and that spark conversation. And that when the credits roll to some extent, you don't feel fully satisfied. Um, you know, and I worked in, in, in just entertainment, um, you know, your audience should feel, with the exception of a cliffhanger, your audience should feel satisfied at the end. Like, ah, I got everything I needed, okay. I zoned out for the last hour and a half, two hours, whatever, <clears throat> and now I'm back to the real world. And, you know, it was kind of just a nice little little mental break from whatever I was stressed about. Um, but, you know, with the films that we're doing, 
we kind of don't want people to, to feel totally satisfied. We want you to feel um, like, like you want something more, you know, when the credits roll, that that's where the work begins, that you're inspired to, to grow in some way, that you're inspired to be a better person, that you're inspired to maybe grow your community. In this case, this is a story of revival. So we're hopeful that, you know, people see this movie and they want to stir some kind of revival or, or be a hopeful person. Um, <clears throat> so those, th those are what we're committed to with the films that we create, um, starting with this one and, and then what we're working on over the next 5, 10, 20, 50, 100 years. <laughs> <laughs> 100 years and good luck for your vision and mission for this company. So, Mr. Kevin, can you please invite our listeners to support this coming movie, The Hopeful? Yeah. So, I would love for everyone to come see the film. Um, you can follow along at thehopefulmovie.com and you can see when showtimes are, um, when it's coming out in theaters. Uh, it'll be, like I said, starting in, in North America here um, first on April 17, and then keep following along um, because you never know when someone picks up this podcast. It might be several months from now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, that's the fun thing about podcasts is uh, you never know when someone's going to gonna jump on. So you might be joining after it's already made its run here in the U.S. So... Um, you may be able to catch it in in Australia, in um, in other parts of the world. So just follow along at thehopefulmovie.com, and you can always see what we're doing with with other projects at hopestudios.com. You are most welcome to come back, Mr. Kevin, and let's promote all the movies that you are making. Let's make Hope Studios empower the world through biblical teaching. So, Mr. Kevin. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs>